I'd ask you to take your Bibles and go back to the book of Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. We're going to begin with reading this passage of Scripture. It is a sobering passage of Scripture. There's a Scripture that ordinarily, as a pastor, I wouldn't be my first choice to pick for a Sunday morning. But it is a very, very important passage of Scripture. Revelation chapter 20, beginning in verse 11 to verse 15, the end of the chapter. John writes, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. From his presence earth and sky fled away. No place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Lord Jesus, these words are not politically correct in our culture. We would rather, Lord, not think of judgment and its consequences in just going about everyday life. We would like to think, Lord, that everything turns out okay in the end, that we'll all be all right. But Lord, when we come to this book, your word that you have given us, your revelation of truth, and you gave this to us, Lord, then we have to believe what you say. And not everything is going to turn out all right for everyone in this world. Help us who know you as our Savior to be sobered by our message today. Help us to understand your truth. Help us, Lord, to be motivated to examine our hearts and also, Lord, to be moved to Take the good news according to our mission that we've committed ourselves to inviting people to know and follow Christ. Lord, may this be a day when our hearts become realigned with the passion of your heart. Our minds become clear about what you tell us regarding the future. May your spirit work among us, we pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Tim Chalice, in a recent blog, indicated that one of the most frequently asked questions in many of the Bible conferences and, and uh, co other conferences he, that he goes to is a question that I have heard asked at conferences that I have attended. And the question goes something like this. Can it really be just for God to punish people eternally? Can, can, can it really be right uh, think about it. When, when you think about a normal person, a person who uh, pays their taxes and who takes care of their family and, and uh, is, is a nice guy, then we all know people like this. And maybe you're one of them. You're, you're sitting here thinking, you know, I'm a, I'm a nice guy. I'm not a, I'm not a wretch. And this, and this person I'm thinking about, he, he's not a Hitler. He's not a... a uh, Jeffrey Dahmer, he's, he's faithful to his wife. Uh, he, he, he does the things he's supposed to do. He takes care of his kids. Is it right? Is it fair that he should, sp should spend eternity in hell? Yeah, I mean, isn't a God that would, that would send someone to hell like that, sort of like a father who would beat his child because he spilled his milk? 
See, the problem we have, we come to this conclusion because we look at the question from, in the wrong way, from, from the wrong perspective. Is it fair for God to punish a person in eternity for temporary sins? See, when we ask the question, we tend to focus on ourselves. And all of a sudden, this, this question gets turned upside down when you begin to think about who we have sinned against and who He is that we have sinned against. Chalice went on to, to summarize it this way, and I like his summary. That's why I'm sharing it with you. He said this, The more we look at God, the more we see the depth of our depravity. And the more we look at God, the more we understand, understand the true horror of our sin. It's true extent and true aim. We've not just been acting out against men, but attempting, look at this, to drive a knife into God. We've not just been sinning against men, but committing treason against our Creator. And now at last... We see the appropriate consequence is not at all inappropriate. And our doctrinal focus today takes us right into that arena of justice from the hand of God. Many years ago, the pastor of Moody Church, Dr. Harry Ironside, was on a mission trip, and he flew overseas, and he was to speak over there. And uh, when he arrived, he was met by a deacon of this uh, national church where he was to speak. The deacon picked him up, and on the way in the car, uh, he asked uh, Dr. Ironside, what are you going to speak on? Dr. Ironside said, what would you like for me to speak on? He said, well, why don't you speak on the love of God? Dr. Ironside said, what text would you like for me to use? And he said, well, I, I think you ought to use... John 3.16, because everybody knows John 3.16. And then the deacon said this, But Dr. Ironside, when you speak, please do not mention hell. Dr. Ironside got up later at the service, opened his Bible, said, I'm preaching on the love of God from John 3.16. He began to read. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not. And He stopped. And He looked right at the deacon and He said, What should I say to them now? What should I say to them? You see, it's, it's not a popular topic. And, and I, I think when, when I think of the subject in front of us, I... I think that we don't mind having conversations about judgment if we don't have to think or speak about the consequences. This morning we are going to look at one of two judgments. In two weeks we're going to look at the other judgment because next week we're celebrating the Lord's Supper and we want to give due attention to that. But here is the statement that we believe here at Memorial Baptist Church about the final judgment. We believe all people will face final judgment. Believers to reward in heaven, that's what we're going to look at in two weeks, and unbelievers to eternal punishment in hell. This final judgment, for those without Christ, we're told, takes place at some place called the Great White Throne. I want to pause before I go any further and help you understand something. I... I find it difficult to make messages like this amusing or entertaining. I, I find it difficult to tell funny stories when we're, we're dealing with the subject matter in front of us. In fact, a preacher over the century ago summarized it very well of how I think, and I'm going to quote him because he, he said it so well. This is what he said. It strikes me that to attempt to make a message on God's judgment amusing or entertaining would be somewhat analogous to hiring a comedian to entertain the witnesses at a public execution. This is not entertaining material, I grant you, but it is true. 
And we have to face unpleasant truth at times. Our text comes from Revelation chapter 20. It's a chapter that does several things for us as the book of Revelation wraps up. It's a chapter that summarizes the sovereignty of God and the futility of Satan as our enemy, and it, and, and it does it in the closing moments of history and the initiation of eternity. That's what's happening in chapter 20. You're having the sovereignty of God come to the front and the futility of Satan move to the rear. Not only that, but this chapter also records, I believe, the vindication of the saints over, over all those who have opposed the gospel and opposed the truth of the gospel and opposed the Christ of the gospel and opposed the church of the gospel. Now, now chapter 20 is a, is a vindication of that. And then I, I think chapter 20 also is a prophetic statement that fulfills all of those prophecies about mankind bowing the knee before Jesus Christ that Paul so eloquently spoke of in Philippians. The thing that really should grip us this morning, the thing that should really pull at our heartstrings, is that what we are reading is reality. This is not a parable. This is not a fairy tale. This is not a story. And I, I can't tell you enough from the bottom of my heart as a pastor and, and as a reader of God's Word and as a believer of God's truth, this will happen. What we are reading and studying today is a reality that will take place, and many that we know will be there. In fact, I shudder to say this. Some of you may be there. Some of you may be part of this scene. I hope not. I pray not. But it is a reality that we have to face. The text tells us that judgment day for the, for the one without Christ, for the unbeliever at the end of history, will be characterized by three consequences. Let me, let me, let me show these to you one at a time, and then we're just, we're just going to look at the text, let the text help us with that. The first one is this. The first consequence is that judgment day for the unbeliever is a day of inescapable confrontation with Christ. It is a day of inescapable confrontation with Christ. The text says, then John says, I saw a great white throne from his presence, the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. Remember, John has just recorded for us Satan's final defeat and and his consignment into eternal punishment of the lake of fire forever. And so you think, okay, what's next? And John now sees a throne. What is interesting to me is when John began his journey of describing for us what he saw and heard, the very first thing he saw when he was caught up to heaven was a throne. Chapter 4, verse 2. And the very last thing he sees... As human history is coming to a close, he sees a throne. And he describes it to us. It's sort of an ominous throne because he calls it a great throne. Now, the word great is a word that's overused in our vocabulary. It has the idea of being exalted above everything else. Literally, the Hebrew word or the Greek word for great means something that is loud, something that is large. Jesus spoke in the, in the book of Matthew about the great tribulation. Later in this text, we're told the great and the small will, will stand before the Lord. And you'll notice here that, that this whole idea of great, it, it's, it's called great not, not because of the throne itself. It, it, is, it is called great because of who is on the throne. That's what makes the throne great. It isn't that its construction is massive. It isn't that you, if you could see it, you would make it one of the wonders of the world. It, it is great because later we're going to see who is seated on the throne. 
And by the way, this is the only throne described in the book of Revelation that has all these adjectives describing it. Great. And then John says that it is a white throne. Now, I thought about that. I thought, white? Well, why isn't it the great black throne? You know, if I were painting this scene, I would have called it a black throne because this is, a, this is an awesome judgment moment cultivating human, cultiv uh, in the end, culminating human history. It's a, it ought to be black. But it isn't. It's, it's not a, a, a jeweled throne sparkling with gems. No, John sees it as a white throne. And I got to thinking, John, why, why is it a white throne? Well, John's been preparing us for this all along. If you go back in the book of Revelation, in chapter 1 and verse 14, Christ has what color hair? Glass? White hair. In chapter 14, verse 14, he sits on a white cloud. In chapter 19, verse 11, he returns on a white horse. Back in Daniel, in chapter 7, verses 9 through 10, the Ancient of Days, which we think refers to Christ, is described with white hair. You read then in chapter 4, verse 4 of Revelation, the celestial beings are wearing white. In chapter 3, Several times, and back in, in this, this chapter 19, just a chapter before it, you have the triumphant saints wearing white. And in chapter 19 and verse 14, these triumphant saints are returning with Christ, riding on white horses. So it's not like this is a surprise. John has been preparing us for this and for his own heart when he looks up and he sees this throne as white. White is always indicative of that which is clean and pure and washed. This throne, simply put, is white because there will not be one sin that will have a positive judgment from this throne. This throne is absolutely holy, absolutely righteous, the decisions that come from this throne, there will be no appeal, there will be no pleading, there will be no piece of paper of negotiation, there will be, there will be no prosecutor, there will be no defense lawyer. It is white. The decisions that come will be right, just. And John's going to prove that to us. So John describes this scene he sees as a great white, and then he uses the word throne. Now there's a significance in the use of the word throne because a throne is indicative of absolute authority in Old Testament and New Testament monarchy. Today in our country, we have, supposedly, it's supposed to work, we have a, a threefold check and balance system judicial branch, executive branch, and legislative branch. And one is to counterbalance the other. However, the highest law in our land is not the president. And it's not Congress. Who is it? It's the Supreme Court. So when you think of throne in the Bible and you think of kingly throne, if you and I were living in a monarchy in ancient days, we would not have appeal to a court. The highest appeal we could go to would be the king. His word would be final. There's no appeal beyond the throne. And so John is helping us see that this is not just a, a light moment. We are now before the king of all kings at the end of history, and there is no appeal. This is it. This is finality. This is where it all, where the rubber meets the road. This is where it all comes down to. Great light. Now, who sits on the throne? I'd like to know who the judge is, wouldn't you? If you hire a lawyer and you're going to go to court, one of the things you want to know, and one of the things that your lawyer should tell you, we're going to go before old judge so-and-so. Now, that could be a good thing or it could be a bad thing, depending on the record of the judge. The judge here is none other 
than the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, how do we know that? Well, the Bible has prepared us for that. In John chapter 5 and verse 22, we are told the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son. And then we are told in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 5 that Jesus alone is worthy to open the scroll, part of which is judgment. In verse 22 and verse, 20, uh, verse 30 of John chapter 5, the Bible says the Father has committed all judgment to the Son. And then Luke tells us in Acts 17, 30 and 31, these words, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed the day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Who is that? That is Jesus Christ. Now is God the Father there? Absolutely. Is God the Spirit there? Absolutely. But remember, God has told us in John chapter 1 that it is Jesus who has revealed the Father to us. And Jesus is the one we see because He's the only one of the Godhead with a physical body. And so it is Jesus that John sees as the presence on the throne. Now, this is very significant, we're going to see in a little bit, because there are many people today who think they don't have to face Jesus Christ. There are people who take His name in vain. Just this week, I, had a, I heard a man say, I wasn't close, but I overheard him say, Jesus Christ. You've heard it at work, haven't you? You've heard people use that as a, as a curse word. Do they know what they're saying? Many times they do not. There are those who have refused and rejected Christ. There are those who have persecuted those who bear the name of Christ. There are those who have made fun of followers of Christ and of the book of Christ. But one day, Christ will meet them, and they will meet Him. And it will be not a two-way street. And it will not be a pleasant conversation. In fact, no one will speak but Christ. So that's the first consequence that John helps us see in the text, and that consequence is that there is a day of inescapable confrontation with Jesus Christ because it says the dead stand before the throne. Now there is a second consequence I want us to see, and it picks up in the last part of chapter verse 12. The last part of verse 12 says this, I saw the dead, and dead small and great standing before the throne, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. So the second consequence is this, the great white throne judgment day is a day of complete disclosure for every unbeliever. It is, a, it is a day of complete disclosure for every unbeliever. The books are opened and another book is opened. Now the opening of the books has great significance. It's the complete record, it's the complete accurate record of all of life of each individual. In fact, in the last part of verse 12, and in the last part of verse 13, two times we are told the effect of this book, and the reason the books are there is because they record what every person has done in their lives. And I suggest it is a complete record, both of the good and the bad. It's all there. Romans 2.6 says, God will render to every man according to his deeds. Deeds are acts are the infallible sign of what fills our hearts. It's what comes out in our lives with what has been hidden in our hearts. Now, I can't be dogmatic, but I wonder if one of those books that are open that day is none other than the Word of God itself. And I think I can prove that because there is a verse in John chapter 12, verse 48, that says this. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge 
The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. So I believe in this day that we call the great white throne judgment, that somewhere the living word is going to take the written word and says, this is what I said. And then the other books are open. The other books are, someone has said, are in a sense vouchers to support what is in the book of life. The Lord says, by your fruit, you will know who belongs to me and who doesn't. It is proof positive, these books are proof positive that the judgment they are about to receive is just. Revelation or Romans chapter 3, verse 19 and 20 says, When God brings judgment, it is so that every mouth may be stopped. At this moment, when Jesus opens the book, I think there's going to be a collective. <gasps> and God begins to go through. You say, Will he go through every record of every life? Yeah, I think he will. That's going to take a long time. Yeah, but we're not in time and space now, we're in eternity. Time is entirely different. I mean, there's when you're in eternity, you got all eternity. And so he begins to go through the record. If, if, if John were seeing this today, he would see a giant computer and thousands and millions of hard drives being pulled out and plugged in. I'm going to play it. Remember that time you took 20 bucks? From your coworker, nobody saw it. In there. It's going to go up on the screen. The time you had that dirty thought about that lady it goes up on the screen. That time you cheated your brother-in-law, nobody ever knew it. It's up there. You see, we we are great people at hiding our true identity of our heart. But those without Christ who have never had their hearts cleansed by the blood of Christ, all of that stuff remains on their record. And it comes up. The books. Text says that the dead will be judged out of those books. Who are the dead? Well, Paul gives us an answer in Romans 1, 5, and 6. He says, according to your hardness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath and the righteous judgment of God who will render to each person according to his deeds. These are people he's talking about in Romans chapter 1 who do not know Jesus Christ as their Savior. They're all standing before the Son of God. The indication is he calls them dead because they've been raised from the realm of the dead. And look at what he says in the text. It says, John, verse, uh, verse 12 of chapter 20, John says, I saw, I was a witness, I viewed the dead, great and small. All classes, all categories are there. The great and small. This, this, by the way, means it is universal. It's universal. Everyone without Christ is there. From the beginning of time to the end of time, they're all there who do not know Christ. And then verse 13 makes it even more specific because in verse 13, the Lord indicates that the judgment is very minute and individual because He says in verse 13, and, and if you'll notice, it says it, in the middle of the verse, each one of them according to what they have done. So this is not... This is not a hiding in the crowd moment. The crowd is there, but you each one are singled out and brought up and made to face the record of their lives. And the evidence is so overwhelming. The evidence is so concrete. The evidence is so indisputable as if they wrote it with their own hand and cannot deny it is their own writing and their own life that they will have nothing to say. The Lord says every mouth will be stopped. All the world declared guilty. The world will be unbelievable. 
somebody put it this way, the great and the small, the big sinners, the little sinners, the rulers, the subjects, nobles, plebeians, the learned, the ignorant, the refined, the vulgar, the civilized, the barbarous, the emperors, the beggars, and all alike are there. And they have one thing in common. You know one thing they have in common? The one thing they have in common is that they're all there as unforgiven human beings. Unbelievers. Their sin has never been washed away. And they stand as finite people before an infinite God with all of their sin exposed for all to see. I cannot imagine the horror of that moment. To be unshielded before the infinite God, have no place to hide and no excuse to give. It certainly has made me appreciate more what Christ did on the cross to save me from that moment. Save me. You're a believer. He saved you from that moment. Because that moment is coming. I think this is truly the meaning of no hope. Paul put it this way in Romans chapter 3. He said, What then? Are we Jews any better than they? Not at all, for we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. There is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. John 3.36, he that believes on the Son has everlasting life, but he that believes not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God rests on him. Now you understand a little bit more what that verse means. It means there's no pockets of our society which are excluded from judgment. All are without Christ. Another person put it this way, from the top of the courthouse to the bars and massage parlors, corporate heads and cab drivers, congressmen and custodians, housewives and harlots, sailors and secretaries, pimps and pastors, will all be there before the bar at the final fork in the road. All of those without Christ. No exception. And all the money and all the possessions and all the status and all the power and all the advantages and all the beauty and all the looks in which our souls have, have sought refuge will absolutely weigh on the scales of God like a bunch of dust being blown away to no avail and to no effect. What we depend on today for our protection will not be in existence at the great white throne judgment. Now there is an interesting phrase here that I wrestled with a long time. I'm not sure I understand it. But the Lord says, if you notice in verse 13, that death and Hades gave up the dead. I could understand that. The grave, all those who have died are in hell today. They're going to be resurrected and stand at the great white throne judgment. But what does it mean when it says the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Now some believe that's a figurative expression because the beast comes up out of the sea. It could be a reference to the earth. However, there is an interesting thing to think about. Do you ever remember water destroying a lot of people in our world who died because of water? When did that happen? That happened back in the flood. All those people, the whole world was destroyed by the flood. Do you know what? They're going to be there because God's going to bring their bodies up out of where the water put them. I wonder if that's a reference to that. I can't be dogmatic, but it makes you think, doesn't it? But they're, that, then we're not done. God opens, Christ opens all these books. There's all the record of their lives. But then something else happens that's interesting. You'll notice in the middle of verse 12, then another book was open singular. Another book was open, which is we're called the book of life. Could this be the Lamb's book of life spoken of in later in chapter 21 and verse 27, earlier in chapter 13 and verse 8 and 17, 8? We, we do know that this, this Lamb's book of life 
is a book that Jesus Christ is in charge of. They're related to him. It's his book. We also have to believe that this is a record of all those who have truly trusted Christ as their Savior. This book is opened up in all fairness to see if all those that are standing there have their names written in the Lamb's book of life. So he's got all the books because you see we're not saved by works, right? John, you believe that we're not saved by works, right? So we're not saved by works, so he opens the books of the works of their life, not to see if their good works outweigh their bad and they can be saved, but to prove that they deserve eternal punishment because of their sin. They have sinned. Here's the record. God had a solution. His solution was not in doing good works. His solution was in Christ. So he goes over and he opens the other book, this just God opens the other book and demonstrates that their names are not written in the book of life. Now let me make two observations here that I want you to pick up on. Number one, as I said this, it's not the absence of good works in the book that dooms a person. It's the absence of their names in the book of life that condemns them. Secondly, think about this. All the names found in that day in the book of life will have been written before that day comes. Notice the text says, were written or have been written at some prior time. There's going to be no names written in that book on the day of the great white throne judgment. It had to happen before that day came. And so if someone says to you, well, I think God will give us all a second chance, you can take them here and say, now, wait a minute here. There's no record in the Bible that God gives anybody a second chance after life is over. God gives plenty of second chances in this life. When this life is over, there are no second chances. That's why we who know Jesus Christ as our Savior are passionate about sharing the gospel with, and should be about sharing the gospel with people today. Because if they die without Christ, there is no tomorrow of a second chance. Not if you believe this book. And I do. So the second consequence is a very dire one. The day of the great white throne judgment is a day of complete disclosure for every unbeliever. And there is one more consequence of this day. The third consequence of this day of the great white throne judgment is this. It is a day of final death for all without Christ. In fact, if you look at the last part of verse 12, we read, they were judged according to what they had done, and the sea gave up all their dead, and they were judged, and death and Hades are thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death. What is the second death? The lake of fire is the second death. That's what it is. Why does God use the term second death? You know death doesn't mean cease to exist. You know that. Even the Greek and Hebrew words for death doesn't mean that. It means departure. It's departure. Uh, I've used this illustration before, but for the sake of clarity, let me use it again. If, uh, if you were to take someone out to the airport and you were to, you were to put them on a plane and, and you would watch them go. In fact, in the airport, you have, on the big board, you have arrivals. And what's the other word? Do you know that you could put the word death up there? Because that's exactly what the, what the biblical word death means. It means departure. So you watch somebody and they depart. Now you don't see them physically anymore, but you know they're alive somewhere if the plane arrives. You arrive somewhere. They're there. Even though you don't see them, even though you don't hear them, they're in, they're in reality. They're there. Same way with death. The second death means a departure. But get this. It is a final departure because now you are separated from God for eternity. Let that sink in. 
where are you? You're in the lake of fire, separated from God for eternity. Well, the text makes an interesting statement when all this happens. Back in verse 11, John, when he sees this great white throne and he sees Christ, who we believe is he, seated, seating, seated on it, he says, from his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. Now this suggests that all of humanity is going to be removed from the earth, because the earth is no more. Earth and heaven fleeing away is the idea of hiding from God. There's no place to hide. John tells us later in chapter 21, very next chapter, verse 1, that he saw a new heaven and a new earth. Well, where's the old heaven and the old earth? It's gone. Remember what Jesus told us in Matthew 24, 35? Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Jesus tells us the heaven and earth we know is going to pass away. Peter taught us in 2 Peter 3, 7 and 10 that the earth and the works therein shall be burned up. Revelation 16, 20 says, Every island, fled, and mountain could not be found. You know, I tried to put this in perspective, what this would mean. You, you take our sun. Every day of my life, you know what? The sun has been in the sky. How about your life? Has it been there? How about your grandpa's life? How about great-grandpa? Was the sun up there? Yeah, yeah. Do you know that the, the size of the sun, if you were to take a giant ice cream scoop tonight and scoop out the insides of the sun and make it hollow, according to science, you could fit within the sun 1,300,000 of our Earth's. 1,300,000 globes the size of our earth would fit in our sun. That's mind-boggling, isn't it? Well, buckle up. There's a planet in our solar system, and it's mentioned in the book of Job. And you think how big our sun is. You could fit all those earths in our sun, but this planet that you mentioned, that was mentioned in Job, you could fit 25,000 of our suns in that one planet. I'm not very good on math, so I didn't figure how many earths would fit in that. You could, you could do that later, but that's, that's a big number. I'm not done. There are 120,000 stars in a constellation. Constellation is a group of stars, a family of stars. And in just one of these constellations, scientists estimate there are 120,000 stars. And so think about this. For as many as there are stars... There are that many constellations in our solar system. I'm not talking about going beyond our solar system, our solar system. The size of this is enormous. You know what happens when Jesus goes and sits on the throne? They all go away. I, I can't I can't even imagine such power. I can't imagine that the presence of one individual will make the whole galaxies, const everything, earth and sky, everything, whoosh, all gone. And you know who's left? People without Jesus as if their feet are buried in concrete. I think the greatest planets in the universe, the greatest buildings in the world, the greatest things that we can't even get our minds around will flee from the face and the presence of the Son of God. But if you don't know Jesus, you won't be able to run. There's no place to hide. There's no earth to stand on. There's no heaven to look gaze at. Only Christ fills your vision. And then we're told the second death is instituted. There are three kinds of death in the Bible. There's spiritual death, 
Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2, we're all dead in trespasses and sins. You know what the remedy of that is? The remedy is turning from your sin and believing on Jesus as your Savior and having life given in place of that death. Then there's another death called physical death. All of us are familiar with that. And the remedy for that, if you're a believer, is the resurrection of the body. And the third death is the second death. And there is no remedy for that. There is no remedy. The best way God could tell us is the second death is best perceived as thinking of a lake of fire. Martin Lloyd-Jones made this statement, and it, it haunts me. We're concerned about men going to war. I wonder if we're equally concerned about the souls of men going to perdition. It is a tragedy for men to lose their lives in warfare, I admit. But is it not a greater tragedy for them to lose their soul? That we would bring passion, saving men from the second death as we agonize when men go through the first death. Time is coming when every person the basis of their relationship with Christ, will meet Jesus at the judgment seat. Pray you'll not be there. Pray you'll not be there. Let me give you some reasons to pray that. Pray you'll not be there because if you are there, the one seated on the throne will show you. Number two, pray you'll not be there because if you are there, you are one of the dead. Number three, pray you will not be there because if you're there, the lake of fire becomes your final and eternal without end destiny. This was a hard message for me to preach. I, I wrestle with the reality of what God just said. I don't want that to be the reality. But I'll tell you, I'd be a liar. and You wouldn't want me as your pastor if I didn't preach the truth of that. But I want to close with some good news. Are you in Revelation? Go back in the same chapter to verse 6. This is where people know Jesus come in. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. That's us. Over such the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with Him for a thousand years. Now, if you don't know Jesus, and you have an appointment at the great white throne, I've got some good news for you. John 5, 24, same person that wrote the book of Revelation, God used to write these words. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes on him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. Why would you not want that? Why would you not surrender your heart to Christ and let Him save you from the second death? John 3.18 Whoever believes in Him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Rest assured, you will deal with Christ one way or another. Hear me, hear me. You will deal with Christ one way or another. My dad used to carry a card that he had printed that he would give out to everybody he met. I was with dad one day, we were in the mall. It was embarrassing to me. I guess you get a certain age, you don't care. 
Someday I'll get there, I guess. And my dad would have these cards. He'd load them in his pocket. As we're walking along, he would give them to people. On one side, I had a smiley face. On the other side, I had this message. If you meet me and forget me, you've lost nothing. But if you meet Christ and forget him, you've lost everything. It's sort of that pebble in the shoe. So today, you have an opportunity to meet Christ in salvation. Today, you have the opportunity to confess that there's only one remedy for your sin, and that remedy is in Jesus Christ and his death on the cross on your behalf. Now, you can get stubborn about it. You can say, you know what? I don't believe that. I think I'm all right like I am. That's okay. You've got that choice. God will let you make that choice. But I'll tell you something. He won't let you choose the consequences. Because someday you will meet Jesus. Jesus will open this book. Jesus will read. Who believes on me has everlasting life. Who does not believe in me shall not see life, but the anger of God is on him. So now you can honestly say, I can't use the excuse I don't know anymore. Because you've just heard. Now you know. We love you. And we want you to come to Christ. We don't want you to be at the great white throne judgment. We want you to be found in Christ. Have your sin not be the object of that judgment. Lord Jesus, today, We pray the Spirit of God would make this message real. Attune our hearts, Lord, to what you say. Help us, Lord, to believe your word. Help us as believers to realize what great deliverance we have been given in Christ. To to wash our guilt and our sins away and to make us right in our standing before the infinite God is is a gift beyond our understanding. I think, Lord, it will take all eternity for me to appreciate what you have done for me and what you've done for all of us who are believers. And, Lord, this morning we don't stand here in pride. We don't stand here in smugness or arrogance. We stand here broken and humbled that such as we, you would forgive and rescue and cleanse and redeem and save. Oh God, that you would do that for such as us is beyond our understanding. We rejoice in its truth, and I pray that our friends and loved ones and those who have gathered today, our visitors, our guests, for those who haven't yet trusted you as their Savior, let this be the moment, let this be the day when they meet Christ as their Savior. Let them not be at that day where they'll meet Christ as their judge. With our heads bowed, I pray for you. If you're not absolutely certain that Jesus Christ is your Savior, that you're in Christ, that you have been forgiven of your sins, I'm not asking if you believe He died on the cross for you. I'm not asking if you believe the Bible. I'm asking if it's ever become personal to you. Have you ever... Just bowed your head before Christ and admitted to Him that you're a sinner and you can't save yourself and quit trying to save yourself. And by by humble uh, spirit and attitude, come to the Lord Jesus. Say, Lord Jesus, I bow my knee to you today. I plead and cry out for you to save me from my sins. I'm trusting you, you alone. That's never happened to you. May I invite you to Christ today? After the service, there'll be some people up here who'd love to pray with you. We, we want you to know Jesus. We want you to know Him. For without Him, there is no tomorrow that you'll want to live in. Lord Jesus, help those of us who are saved to understand our responsibility, to appreciate our grace gift of salvation. Lord, to be generous in the giving and sharing of it with others. Pray it in Jesus.